of the understanding between foxes and light. I would like to start off with the first poem from this book by Amy Lee Cutler. Long after you left for Virginia, I plant tomatoes. I plant tomatoes. I do not cry. I plant tomatoes. All right, that is how we started off the understanding between foxes and light, which was published in 2013, which was eight years ago. It's been quite an eight years. Uh, uh, it's like the understanding between 2013 and 2021. It's been a crazy ride and we're really excited. We have nine amazing poets for you um, who uh, are gonna really, uh, I think, help us all feel just a little bit of something uh, today because uh, I think we're all needing it. Our first poet um, up is Janet Hamill. Janet, just unmute you. Am I okay? You're great. Okay. Hi, everyone. I want to thank Great Weather for having me and for publishing me in the second of your uh, anthologies. I think you're just a great, fabulous press. So I'm going to start by reading my poem in um, The Understanding Between Foxes and Light. It's a brilliant title and it's called Vowels. <clears throat> a little bit about synesthesia and Rimbaud. It's written in the style of his vowels. A red, E black, I white, O white, U orange, vowels. I will tell you now of the red of Alpha, the first wounded beast out of the desert, the blood of the sun, carnations blooming from a heart torn out of a chest at the top of a steep pyramid. Night dens of masochistic mystery. E likes a walk on the wild side, black leather whips, binding straps, a mask, to conceal the terror of ejaculation. It's so easy to swim in black pools if that's your choice. For more tempered souls, there's always the elusive black narcissus. I find white buildings to be Hart Crane's best book. Rectangular white pages home to the six greatest sea voyages ever made wide from the white slab of Melville's headstone, an immortal Leviathan swims through the white architectural heights of New York skyline. You may find another white letter overdone, but O is voluptuous, not straight and narrow like I. O is an open mouth, the white breast, belly, and buttocks of the first Venus, the occupant of a size extra, extra large slip. Orange windows at sunset on the West Side Highway, you. The umbrellas of Cherbourg may as well have been orange. Mango sherbet, the burning sensation when you swallow an Uruguayan liqueur. Now I'll read a couple of poems from uh, my selected poems, which uh, came out just, just at the dawn of the pandemic. Just wonderful. But, uh, this is uh, a map of the heavens, selected poems, 1975-2017. Um, and I'm just gonna read a, few, a couple of poems from this. This first one is Caravaggio. I had a boyfriend who reminded me of Caravaggio, of the, uh, the boys that Caravaggio painted, I should say. I'm in a small Mexican town outside Oaxaca. The sun is crawling like an orange serpent through the window. A white sail disappears over the jungle. I walk through the wombs in a green satin slip amulets on either shoulder strap, 
bleeding hearts of Mary Magdalene, laces in black are wrapped around my ankles. Caravaggio dreams in the bedroom, heat siesta, wandering the waterfronts of all the ports and all the cities of the world. His skin is flushed with a mild fever and blue Gulf Stream fly fish lie across his thigh. Hold on, hold on. Fly across his thigh. Fly across his thigh. The walls perspire like the exhausted flesh of a youthful Bacchus, damp, indulgent sheets. A parrot screams behind my back. The scarlet blood drops leave a trail down my legs. The laces tighten and I feel so sore inside. A raving barracuda took a bite of something tender. The red tower. In a sea I lived in solitude. And it bore me up on a wave over the marketplace, pacing like an injured animal. It bore me up over the land of sleep and poison flies, a tower rising through the fields of maleficence. My tongue in flames, my fountain overflowing in the cold night air while strong winds blew along the battlements. Naked stars, millions and millions of miles away. On the open heights, I could feel their light entering my skin. Above the din of buzzing flies, I rode, rose above the parasites of bloodsuckers who drained me of my will. Swallowing fire, I climbed up to my wilderness with a flight of frozen songbirds in my heart. And I'll read one more from the selected. And uh, <clears throat> this is uh, from Knock. It's a series of pantoons. And this is from uh, Knock, of, Knock of Hollywood, which is all about the United States. And this, this one is about driving across country, in fact, driving through Nebraska during the night. <clears throat> Nebraska at night, tracking Pawnee footprints and escaped Spanish horses. Along the braided river, stars thrive in satellite clusters. Ogallala, Sutherland, the rush of waters from Wyoming and Colorado to join in North Plate. Ground control to Major Tom. Commencing countdown, engines on. Along the braided river, stars thrive in satellite clusters. Ogallala, Sutherland, space on earth, sweet darkness. From the passenger sheet, street seat of a panel truck, Ground control to Major Tom. Commencing countdown, engines on. And the headlights on Route 80, oncoming miles left behind in cowboy land. Space on earth, sweet darkness from the passenger seat of the panel truck. Led Zeppelin's stairway to heaven, beam down on set. Silos of soy and grain, and the headlights on Route 80, oncoming miles left behind in cowboy land. The deaths of Hendrix, Joplin, and Morrison when love's blossom opened in slow motion. Led Zeppelin's stairway to heaven beamed down on silos of soy and grain. Between here, here and there, angels sat at the controls. How else to explain the radio? The deaths of Hendrix and Joplin and Morrison when love's blossom opened in slow motion. Nebraska at night, 
tracking pony footprints and escape Spanish horses. Uh, to conclude, uh, I'm gonna read uh, just a few poems from uh, something I just completed, a manuscript I just completed, which is still untitled. It's going to be published by Vehicle Editions. And uh, it's a two word title. The second word is windows. And I'm, I haven't come up with the adjective yet. For, for, I need an adjective or an adverb for window. Working on that. So, <clears throat> this is flying monkeys. In some ways, this uh, this anthology, uh, this collection, I'm sorry, is uh, a surreal memoir. I'm not used to writing about myself directly. This is about as direct as I've, I've ever gotten. Maybe it has something to do with aging. It's a flying monkeys about uh, when I was a wee one. Lottie, the landlady's knickknacks rattled in glass cages, cases under the wings of flying monkeys. We didn't want to pee in our snowsuits, but she had locked us out. A wickeder, wickeder, wickeder witch there never, never was. When the men came to shovel the snow down the chute, from a pink silk purse, the good witch of the east threw the keys onto the sparkling white ground. Kitchen yellow egg yolks and toasted finger soldiers marched across the roses on the linoleum tablecloth. Every Thursday, the marvels of the Queen Mary or Queen Elizabeth with five red and black smokestacks between them. Our uncle's tugboats maneuvered the Holland American line ships into piers 37 through 41. <clears throat> That's about Weehawk in New Jersey where uh, I was born in Jersey City and spent the first five years of my life in uh, Hudson County. And then the family moved to up north to Bergen County in New Jersey and <clears throat> where it was much more rural and uh, this is about the woods which was my favorite place in our new new uh, home. Chief Oritani lived across the street from the fox in a dark wood I found myself leaving the movies every crackling branch seemingly endless and eternal came through the canopy in patches of light. Aspen, beech, birch, and maple's winged sea pods. I pressed one to the tip of my nose, alone with a ham and cheese on rye. Some kids were afraid to guard the new fort spanning the swollen stream. On the threat of attack, visions were the moments I was bravest. Before Chief Oritani, of the Hakan Kashaki, of the Turtle Clan, of the Lenny Lenape, having attained old age through a knife at my sneakers. A sage negotiator, he mastered fire, water, earth, and air, and, mo and movies after a run in Times Square. Janet, we have time for one short one. Yeah, that's what I've got, one more. Okay, great. And this last one is Lamentation after uh, Jado, his angels. Okay. The sky is everything. Though he labors over it, the sky is effortlessly blue. A deep, a depth of field of angels lamenting the limitations of prehistoric antelope or buffalo as they emerge in the light. Little helicopters, the haloed birds of heaven, Hum over the foreground, mourning Mother Mary, saints and sinners alike. They pray, they cry. The hallowed birds of heaven dive into and push the sky behind them. For it is everything. It is more than the ceiling of the chapel at midnight. It fades and peels. It, it bleeds into the edges of the future. 
stars never realized, peaks never mounted, trees spare of sparrows, singing of three-dimensional angels, little helicopters of heaven carrying a new canvas to drop, to drape the eyes of everyone in blue infinity. Thank you very much, great weather. Let's hear it for Janet Hamill, everybody. And Janet, feel free if you want to put a link to uh, to to your book for your collection into the chat box, then oh. be, and and that goes for all our readers today. If you have something that you want to refer uh, folks to, that's all right. And in the meantime, our second reader today is a real hybrid, a uh, visual artist, a playwright, an essay writer and a poet with a distinctive voice you will never forget once you hear it. It's time for Kofi Fosu Forson. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Great Weather for Media. And thank you for publishing my poem. I'm going to start off with that very poem called Kingdom of Horse. Kingdom of whores with tattoos, cracked teeth, chipped fingers, fading nail polish. Bedford Avenue girls crash as a fuck finale, end of nookie, booty call, the quickie. Tumbling between crowds, cockroaches, rice fanatics, bearded, leather boots, proud. Sophomores inside pastel bars, light beers in hand, effeminate, intimidated, sexless. Bartenders, masculine, alpha males, channel spirits, sex gods, potions, concoctions, nights, an iPod, vinyl record tormenting our soul, an edge we choose to love or kill. Running away from ourselves into company, others, lovers, friends, worst enemies, fear, cavity pulled at root, imagining world outside where we drink with wolves. Sit among murderers, nightmarish room, music, dark corners where people kiss. Draw themselves into conversations, one act plays, hoping for moments of bliss. Half lives damaged, new generations blast the walls with shit, Howard Street Corner. Headlights flashing onto excrement, cage four feet above ground, wooden door. Piss Christ, Karen Finley, they were the first. Kathy Acker said, fuck me in public. You best in girls, barely legal. Posters inside jail cells, middle-aged men wanking off. God, platinum blonde pop star with bikini wax giving blowjobs back of limousines. Post-feminism, pussy was king, butchers on wheels, death, dying arms of heroin chic. Model Amour. Design porn, fetish, celebrity magazines, Richard Kern, photographs. Women politicizing the word bitch, carving a niche within this dog domain. Men emasculated, porno pathetic, penetrated by well paid strippers strapped on. Fantasy I always had, would have wanted to tie up Belinda, read her Baudelaire. But was she muse, fallen desire on blankets as I crept drunken? kissing her feet, leaving this crowded dorm room, returning accompanied by another familiar. Pummel me, leather boots, belt, fist, chaos, drunken student, walk, scattering. Slave in a hierarchy, displacement, black intellectuals, diagnosed, white, disease, love neurosis, falling for Euro-American women, those who prefer black English. Post neo expressionist gangsters chaperone white dolls through ghetto scums. Crack addicts, prostitutes, middle aged divorcees, odd whores share in empathy. While educated black women disown their very own black male syndrome. Gang or crew level threats onto these streets, left their mark, paint, tags, blood. Dangerous minds attracting desperate junkies, feasting on the crime of art. But your women wandering the city alone, Central Park to Sundays in Tribeca. In eyes of men walking fantasies for some, 
chance to dream or perhaps undress. Inspiration for artists who fought for light in these girls they saw potential. Muses loving, wearing their worth on these men like coats, oil seeping through skin, making art, posing for paintings, traveling for miles, just be faced in a photograph. Women beg to have philosophy whispered in their ear, wilting in fear for men who turned them into sex muses, new era of porno kings, smut sadists, fuck girls on videotape, posted them for world to see this, our new kingdom, whoredom seeking fame. History reminds us of frontier women, Hollywood, our girls go by, not a thing we would change, grow wild seeds, spread wild flowers. Savoir Brise, Blue Angels Singing War Songs. A, song for Clara, sound of her broken voice, bear witness, listen. How we spin on the axis of our true identity, spreading over of love as disease. Post fanatic, drinking absent from show, horror in her eyes, she opens wide to let out a sound, fetish, irony within the pelvis, an incision would mark end of our affair. A fetus, club fascination of a hundred feet, fighting is a hell gathering in the mind, loud as an orgasm on meth, sapiosexual. The word caricature on a necklace as tattoo branding on skin. This sentence would best describe us. I am everything you were alive before. No sense explaining. The future is a cracked mirror. B, lamenting the sentiment of lit candles in a dead night, how horror tilted from wrath to begging for salvation. What disease mine is this? Well thought out memories, hunger for embrace, my divinity, your cults, watching wings fall at length, white in its mercy washed over with gold. I have been born again underground, watchmen stunted, all that was rage kept hidden like an oven at 500 degrees. At once blood boiled, strengthening the bones then again, it was war, lust at the tip, scratching dead skin. Into the world I came, a male hooker begged for fire in my lungs. See, hazardous was the history, left at the water's bank were our other selves. At all hours, representations of failure ignited the sky bombardments, fields lay post-orgasmic, a conquering awaited possession. This was his hand taken hostage, blistered fingers, sore knuckles and broken thumb. How does one make fists when the limbs lack alignment? With victory, we would have watched them surrender beside the barracks rioting a song in its heart, belting, blue melody, music for the heartless, love unrequited. D, charades after an administered bong, she begs beside me. Le russe a fieve, thoughts of soldiers playing, mechanics soldering, at the base were firing squads, centuries of hair warped. She had fallen by the bar, an empty martini glass in hand. Torturous, Savoir Brise, blue angels singing war songs. The ocean washes ashore. From window, a curtainless moon. To death, under sex, our midnight puppetry. Love as aftermath. What we once were, 
now misadventure, and clothed mannequins absurdly assemble. I'd like to end with this one here. Portraits of disfigurement. During the pre-half century, I would have hungered for you. Night after spent, rabbit proved my damaged biochemistry. Defied death long ago, anonymous, an ambulance drove me. Does carcinogen and grenade meet me now, chained to a bed? Poor man's fate. What if life I lived welcomed ongoing storms, possessed thug at heart, born to laugh at father's cleft chin, mimic then naturally his sophisticated attempt at seduction. Bless these wigs from those mothers of cancer plagued children, farms they come from, antipsychotic, narcoleptic, deadened, reddened, scumbags premeditate disfigurement, legs that wiggle. This our celebrated ceremonious celebrity for better syndrome. Slip into the silvery shoes, glass crown above your dizzying head, emerging length of your wingspan around helplessness of me. Arto, length of your wingspan, Arto. Artist nominated as forebearer will be called Antonine. She became, I trust your power to mourn me, blessed, shrouded, black velvet skin, your touch, immaculate, welcoming like water. Thank you. Let's hear it for Kofi Fosu Forson. Wow. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, these next two poets are sh sharing a slot together. We have Michelle Bonchek and Robert Elroy. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, thanks so much for setting this up. I wish we were in New York and we could go to dinner after this, but Jane and Tom, it's so good to see you and Mary. Um, so we are, we're, we're, let's see, broadcasting. Is that the verb? Broadcasting, yes. Now we're in Oregon. Now we're in Oregon. <laughs> so it's a little early for wine, but we figured we'll celebrate with you anyway. Um, do you want me to go first? Um, if, whatever you like. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. That was the plan. <laughs> so I have a few poems I'm going to read. Um, this first one, uh, Gestation, is in the new issue of Willow Springs. Um, gestation. We are saving the white rhino, weaving six foot probes through rectums, maneuvering major blood vessels like 16 year old boys around traffic cones. We are sliding eggs from ovaries grasping thin tubes toward gloved hands dangerously, pulsing a fraction of an inch each time the heart beats. We eject them into petri dishes, perfectly pocked eggs, safely shining in fluid like little wet suns. We are extinguishing Aedes aegypti, aegypti, tinkering males, silencing buzzing sperm. In labs, millions hatch, are irradiated, then dropped from planes into cities to mate with the wild mosquito. Her see-through wings, blood-tipped lips, skirts so short you can see her stinger. We are reducing the population of lionfish, those waterborne porcupines exploding by millions along eastern shores. We are garnishing them with pickled radishes, charging $25 a plate. We watch the sunset while picking meat from between our incisors. We are saving the sand cat who can survive temperatures between 23 and 125 degrees, transferring 21 embryos, freezing 29. Only one embryo in plants, but it splits, blooms in two. 
When they arrive, we will name them after planets or gods, something unreal, something terrifying, Venus, Vulcan, Shantico, Hephaestus, who, if given metal and fire, can recreate the world. <clears throat> so this next poem, this is one of my little experiments I've been doing. Um, I take literary journals and, you know, there are erasure poems where you go through books and you, you blank out words and you make poems from what you leave out that's not covered. So what I've been doing is actually cutting out words and phrases from journals and piecing them together like collages. Um, and it's, it's similar, but it, it takes a lot of different voices. So instead of just using the, the one page, and blanking out words, I have all different types of ideas and images and put them together like a collage. So this isn't titled, but I, I like this one. Um, and it came from issue 31 of Sulphur. You decide that your God is the moon, the tortoise, parsley and the canary, the sun, I cannot know indefinable shapes, bats asleep in the earth, parts of myself unopened. The mouth enters to see us naked. The horse escapes the heart's enclosure, the fragments of a serpent turned in on itself. I believe in the river, the glassy egg, the damp roots swelling their music. Love, there's a shape that you made out of the bones the hummingbird touched. They walk, they pause, they move on. Doing okay on time? I have time for one more and then I'll go. Okay. <clears throat> oh, this was inspired from a news article I just saw a couple weeks ago um, about the oldest forest in the world being found in, in the Hudson River Valley. So um, my family had a, had a cabin up in Roxbury, and it's just up the road from there. So I wrote this, it doesn't have a title yet. The oldest forest in the world is found in Cairo, New York, a root system stretching out like a crown of rivers flat on the bottom of an abandoned quarry just up the road from the abandoned cabin of my youth, the earth, claiming old soda pop cans and ripped flannel sheets, pink insulation puffs blowing across the fields like milkweed, the roots of that ancient forest, the roots of my family life, both in the Hudson River Valley, both living quietly in the wind, far enough away from the cabin to feel alone, but close enough to hear my mother call. I used to sit on a flat stone polka dotted with fossils, the old stories all around me, a sign language waiting to be translated. In the quarry, Three scientists stand on the flattened root system like the slide of a microscope, my fingers tracing the lines of shells caught in that rock telling the story of an old sea. I still feel the New York sun on my long brown hair and shoulders, the wet of my bathing suit spreading, darkening that rock, the air taking water back to sky to the canopy of clouds drifting in shapes overhead. I have one more, or you want to go? I think uh, I think I should probably get going. Good. Okay. And now, Rob. <laughs> Hello, everybody. So this first poem is it's an old one, and it started off with a conversation that an actual conversation I had with my brother um, at our grandmother's house many years ago. I think as we were getting ready to leave, um, and then it kind of goes into uh, other situations that happened years, months, or years later and some that are just made up um, and takes on many voices. But the first couple of lines here are a conversation that um, I wrote from, that I had with my brother. My brother says, when the black bird is hungry, it is part of you that is hungry. And if there are two, part of you is hungry and part of you isn't. He says this as we drive to find the highest point in Ohio, we pass it riddled in the roundabout hills of a cornfield, unknowing, unknowing, into the city that packed the first concrete road. Built now, our knowledge is innate. We see how they vulcanize rubber into thick blubber skin. This is what existence is, brother says, and pollination and a nail that keeps a boat afloat. 
We give rise to us. We exist because we are made of other things, he says. We crack and break and reconstruct ourselves. Seven years and we have a new set of cells. On the drive to Mammoth Cave, we talk of time, our ongoing hope on this side of the coffin. But we decide talking of time is a waste. We too are waste, being postured upon mountain apex, sucking a sexy nipple, or tun tunneling our body through earth are highlights of some, pers of some personal universe. This road is part of you that is buried, brother says. The road is part of you that is moving, I say. We encase nuclear waste in concrete, radio says. That will last 10,000 years, I say. Uranium-238 has a half-life of 4 billion, brother says. Now, when I say we, I mean you and me, and also them and those people, us, orator, human, animal, universal allegiance of those who suffer. That means all of us. Our death has already happened. When you see time is li as linear, it is your fault, multiple dimensions say. It is not like a road, plate tectonic says. Soon the road will crumble, be swallowed, and then be everywhere. It already is. We're one with the road. We see the blackbird. This one's called rain. It starts to rain. Drops could be made of stars. The sky looks empty. Something is there turning in the atmosphere that birds fly away from, that cause children to put down toys in search of mother. It's uncertain. Silence soaks into the yard of Summer's breast to quiet her breathing. The air is brandy, mushroom, and molasses. Elegies linger as fog settles for the night over houses lined up like gravestones. After some great disease of passion stripped the color from our eyes and skin, rammed our hue into each star like the muzzle of a musket, and shot like a firing squad through a small white handkerchief into our hearts. One or two more. One more? OK, one more. Schism. I want to be joined with someone, connected, globalized. I will be satisfied by K-pop blogs and videos of golden retrievers. I imagine black ash covering bone, fossilizing. There was a time when bells in the distance meant something. Father mends me with his strength. My body opens out of a black hole, like through a church door. All the reverence invisible inside pushes me out, pulls me through the space between cells, the space between space, like walking between raindrops, like walking between this life and the next, or my life and yours, like information rushing a copper wire. A cry for help turned to electromagnetic wave burning through the solar system. White ash covers black bone, slick with burning fat. The man across the street loves his lawn so intensely it replaces himself. Burning sticks in the backyard, I am between days, sun and moon, clock hours, particle and wave, between stimulus and brain waiting for you to come out of the smoke between life and after. I like that one. <laughs> the dog fell asleep. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Let's hear from Michelle Bonchek and Robert Avery. Thank you very much. OK, so it's my pleasure now to bring on the next reader. Um, who also keeps a foot uh, in two different fields, um, a theater artist as well as a poet. It's time for Christian Georgescu. Come on, Christian. Everyone, I'm so thrilled to be part of this anthology, um, and, and I'm happy to be all, with you all tonight. Um, I write in character in these three pieces are part of a larger show called House of Me. Um, the first piece is called Passion Statement of the Saint and that appears in this anthology. It's written as a financial statement. So here we are, 
the master bedroom, a dead room where the tragic happens. When you got it, you got it. The rest is just shrapnel. Now, whatever happened to my four poster California king? Um, I used to be sort of a king, but I'm developing sort of callousness to the sort of thing. And I sort of think that unless my name appears above the title, 50% greater than that title, I'm staying in bed. The cover's over my head. Uh, I have forfeit my crown, upset my title. Now I'm just an icon and I've grown idle. So don't click on me and don't bet on me. This down comforter does not fit, does not offer any comfort. It cannot cover the truth of the matter, which is we've made our bed. And now we must lie in it, sigh in it, forever asking why in it. Why tell the truth when we can lie every minute of the live long day? Oh, it's going to be another long, long day. So we just lay on our sides, lay on the lies, and sigh. We're hurting inside, but no one shouts. Like these window panes, we are excruciatingly pained, but no one shouts. No one speaks our wishes aloud in this house and in this room. And boy, are we loud. I mean, if these walls could talk, they'd speak Valium. Look away and turn down the volume. I mean, if we could walk the talk and not just talk the talk, if we meant a word we said, we would, but we just talk and just talk and we're all talk and we all talk and talk and talk and talk and get no action. Lights, camera, roll the unsound and drop the chicka boom, 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 beating of our hearts against the rib cage. And I know now why the depraved, enraged bird sings against the dark. At the end of a long, long day of free shipping and many happy returns, um, we return to the family room where uh, undeterred from the undertow of a life lived against the grain and pray each of us for fame to be delivered to our doorstep. In the family room, we staycate and vacate and placate ourselves with nothing other than knowing nothing, nothing other than the known, the norm, mal dosage, which is required. This room is where you go if you want to be in the known, in the little comfort zone, where you stay in the normal range. If you want some warmth, you come here, but I can't feel anything. You know, I'm going cold and remote, so please don't touch me. It might mean too much to me. And there's no room for error in this room. In the family room, we are pH balanced, pharmaceutically correct, farm fresh, hermetically sealed in, medically sealed within the approval rating system. Say ahem and amen. We're waiting for your approval. Please be like us. Please like us. Please be like us. We're waiting for our ships to come in. Please be like us. Waiting for our descriptions to be filled. We're waiting for our prescriptions to describe us the best. Please like us. Please like us, babe. Don't be like us. Save yourself from this. Our airs are conditioned. Our love conditional. We're striving to exist, pretending to live. Is this condition pre-existing? Hair flip. Lip gloss, get lost. We are too fantastic for this description. Maybe you need your prescription refilled. We feel nothing. In the family room, we're so fatal and so vacant, so blatantly aching to get intimate. And when it comes around, we're waiting for something beautiful, something true, something that feels right in this dark night of the soul. And when it finally comes, ah, I don't know. Just can't get into it. We pray and pray and pray and wait and wait and wait to intuit something divine, something of our greater selves. And ah, I don't know. We're craving the intimation, but hate the introspective deviation from the norm. This is the prime time life, but nothing fits. Call it a fatal room. And it's showtime. At night, 
When the house is quiet as a mouse, my skeletons asleep, my demons a slumber in their closets, all the sparrows returned home, I roam the coffin halls of memory, looking for you, grasping at fading yesterdays, lift the darkened corners of a carpet seedy with today, feeling for you in the walls tapestried with a lifetime, lifetimes of separation. Amidst the tumult and the cobwebs of the mind, your voice echoes through the chasm, lights the catacombs of my heart. And in the silence between breaths, your name reverberates in my bones, inscripted on my cells. And there, in the deepest core of me, I find you, indelible, glistening, pure, eternal. Thank you so much for having me. I love reading with you all. Let's hear it for Christian Georgescu. Wow. That was fantastic. I also just looked up in 2013 when this came out, the number one movie in 2013 was uh, Hunger Games, Catching Fire. So I don't know why I'm telling you that, but I'm just looking up things when this book came out to when crazy things happened. Uh, next up, we have Cat George. Oops. Hi. Uh, I'm going to read uh, the poem from the book first, which is a beautiful book, The Understanding Between Foxes and Light. The cover was done by Thomas Hugh Laurel himself, along with Katie Payton. So it's a beautiful book. You should definitely check it out on the Great Weather for Media website. Three Body Problem. Is it regret in life to avoid killing all you hate? Or is this the code that matters? That some will live dissatisfied for the benefit of clowns who don't give a shit? Or maybe some need dissatisfaction to live, pleasured by torment's clarity. Seek counseling, seek counseling, they sue with the mockery of former drinkers. Seek soothing, soothe seeking, discover the pleasure of boredom. How the fuck do you think the world was built anyway? Satisfied, we would have stuck to caves and no one would have invented the wheel. Yes, it's true. After months of therapy, I finally realized my real father was Attila the Hun and he treated me badly throughout my youth. Beatings led to rapes, etc. Having realized now the source of my dissatisfaction, I'm self-actualized. That's what they said. I got the paper to prove it. My self has been actualized, actualized to make realistic. I look in the mirror, immediately stick a knife in my throat and slice. Father, son, Holy Ghost, Adam, Eve, Apple, mother, file, father, child, me, you, and am I seeing double or doting on a vision of the past? The three body problem has plagued scientists for years. Two bodies are predictable in the way they move around each other. Gravitational pull of the larger body compared with the position of the smaller body leads to an absolute knowledge of the path of their rotation. Introduce a third body and everything changes and no one knows why or how. Lagrange discovered a partial solution within the Trojan group, two asteroids of Jupiter that revolve in a complex pattern around the sun by maintaining the formation of an equilateral triangle. Father, son, Holy Ghost, mother, father, child, Adam, Eve, Apple, me, you, and who's who? Buy four copies, it will make you sound more interesting. Hey, we were down, bound to lose. We were grouped at a tavern. After a couple, someone said with a slur, how about a giant horse we hide inside to fool the enemy? We raised toast, how about it? In a hundred bars, we had heard a thousand wacky ideas. No one ever did anything they said they were going to do. So we got in the habit of praising the amusement of ideas themselves. Giant horse, sure, give this guy a drink. We didn't even notice he had already left his stool to start working on it. We didn't even notice when, weeks later, we were inside it, heading toward the gate of the city of dreams. We are not contained by mythology, only stuck within its trappings. Inside our horse, pressure increases. The three of us react with mounting confusion, bouncing like molecules, excited by different degrees of heat. No formula to predict the outcome. Dissatisfied, we continue, driven by the sun, 
steering recklessly toward fire. Whoa. And I have two more. Please, can't we just have a phone meeting? Childhood Disney memory, a pavilion in Tomorrowland with a phone exhibit. You in one room, your friend in another, pick up the receiver, magic. Not just a disembodied voice, but a screen with your friend talking to you via a video call. This is so cool. I wonder if we'll get this in our lifetime. Flash forward, COVID-19 memory, I wish. No, not another Zoom call. Do I have any food in my teeth? Anything in the background that shouldn't be there? My hair sucks today. Is that ketchup on my shirt? Damn, I have to sneeze. No, I'm not sick, really. Shit, my husband just started singing in the shower. Press mute, turn off camera. Honey, I'm on a call. Sound on, camera on. Crap, he didn't hear me. He's coming in here, dripping wet, naked. What did you say? How many times do you have to click leave meeting before you actually do? And finally, <laughs> I found love. I found love in a concrete stairwell once and what I thought was love in an LA alley. I found love in a magazine, a shower, and once under a table after dessert. I found love in a San Francisco nightclub next to the bar listening to poetry on my knees, zipper down. And in San Francisco, I found love in a storefront theater, the bed on a loft, the stage for a kitchen, dead ass broke and happy. I found love on the red eye to Chicago once, swapping stanzas from the four quartets as others slept and the flight attendant kept bringing more vodka. I found love in a San Francisco SRO hotel, pay by the week, no discounts, too bad if you don't have the rent. I found love in North Beach, wandering streets and bars, sipping bitters for hiccups, reading, riding a neighborhood nomad in the fog. I found love in my parents' eyes, telling them I'd be moving 3,000 miles away. We just want you to be happy. I was. I found love on Canal Street, newly arrived in NYC, standing still, listening to five conversations, each in a different language. I found love after a New York blizzard, starving, trying to hawk a trumpet at a jewelry store, just as three angels walked past and dropped two fifties and a 10 on pure white snow. I found love at New York poetry meetings. I found love jamming with hydrogen jukebox, nervous at the Bowery Poetry Club, absorbed by Cornelia Street Cafe, the endless open mics, the themed shows, my favorite, the Meyer Lansky Poetry Tribute. Oh yeah, I found love there. I found love in three rooms, writing, reading, making books dance, listening to records, dancing in between. Oh yeah, I found love there. I found love with no money and love with some money, but never found love of money leading to love or anything like it. I found love in one person, a gift that makes me radiate love to share all I have found with anyone who has not found love in a leaf, a notebook, a child's eyes laughing. So much pain everywhere, rivers of pain, gutters of pain. And yet in this breath, I found love again in a breath reading these words, I found love, I found you. Thank you. Let's give it up for the irrepressible Cat Georges. Thank and you. You can find work by Cat Georges from our friends at Three Rooms Press. And now it is my honor to call up to the mic a multi-instrumentalist and one of the eminences of spoken word poetry in Goma Hill. In Goma, take yourself off mute if you need to. Hello. Yes, and your camera is off right now. Uh -huh. There you go. All right. Give me just a split second. Let's rock out. 
It's good to see all of y'all. I'm really happy to be in the anthology. And um, let's just do this. amongst the meat eaters, devourers of ground dead cow carcass, smelling fried blood boiled in oil, medium rare they babble, stupid cow eaters, intestines reeking of garbage, garbage cans for stomachs crying, help me, help me, save me from dis Eats. Food is eating me. Food is eating me. Flesh consumption, constipation, karma crying, colon cancer, candidate with a date for the cemetery. Money can't save you. Oh, conspicuous victim of consumer culture, disguised as culture, eaters of unborn chicken fetus, ground pig carcass on the side. You can't hide. Breakfast may kill you. Faster than AZT, which is deadlier than HIV. Faster than a PBA and that motto, kill a brother a day. Or the BLA, kill a pig a day, keep oppression away. Supermarket refugee, you can't hide. We charge you with genocide. Blood sucking causes insanity. Remember, you are what you eat. Beef, tongue, pig, feet. Red dye, cancerous, USDA certified, the government lied. Call yourself a hot dog, slowly dying like a hog. Color me an anti-commercial for the meat industry. See what we can do next. 40, 36, 36, 36, 36, 36, 36. Um, this is uh from something I've been working on. It's a series called uh, Corona Chronicles. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
past, past, puff. The ancestors crowded the kitchen, knocking food onto the floor, eating before their red cracked plate could be piled high with food and served from ancient recipes and DNA passed down from mouth to ear. Water flooded the floor. Oshun made her presence known, pounded yam, snail and a goosey stew prepared. O Salah accepts these prayers and offerings on this ninth trip around the sun. I'm having trouble remembering what day it is. Blame it on COVID. Everyone is masked or quarantined. It seems like Groundhog Day. Last week disappeared. I didn't know it was gone. It's a bit disturbing when I can count the number of my friends that are still on the planet on 10 fingers. The world is at my fingertips, but I miss the feel of earth between my toes. Though I'm a city dweller, I lived on hillsides many lives ago. Years create some foolish thought that time can be measured. It's only a mirage spawned by mortals but who is to say what is real or how long it takes to build a pyramid when all existence is immediate and past, present, future is synonymous? She came singing happy return of the sun through the manger of Capricorn, not the sun, sun. The planets still rotate, only change is constant. All the news got me buying stock in body bags. How do I know if the vaccine is not more deadly than the dis-ease? Will there be a COVID shot police in a prison cell for those who refuse to be human lab rats? So we stand on the edge of a new decade and all the passwords say expired. Just a little something, something. Everybody good? Got I got more time? Let's see. Give me, give me a second. Do that die you. After my year-long backpacking trip through sunny Southeast Asia, walking on concrete seemed really strange. Trying to sleep in a, be a bed was weird too. It seemed like it was too soft. It was still hot in Virginia in September, so at least I wasn't shocked by the weather, but buses backfiring had me wanting to duck for cover. Labor Day fireworks didn't help much either. I wasn't working yet, so with time on my hands, wooded parks were quite comforting. My boys had supplied me with a steady diet of revolutionary literature, and the camaraderie of the brothers in Nam had me thinking the revolution was about to jump off. After all, the last poets and Black Panthers were all in the news. J. Edgar Hoover had declared them dangerous. Red, black, and green buttons and necklaces with black fists were popular too. I came back 
mad as hell with an itchy trigger finger, ready for the shit to jump off. Cambodian red and tabs of good acid comforted me, but otherwise didn't help the problem either. either. Nobody told me I was suffering PTSD. There was no debriefing. Had me thinking there was some real black unity back in the world. My marriage was going to shit. Paranoia had me thinking everyone was an agent. After attending the Panther rally, I learned the feds were questioning my friends. The idiots paid me a visit, asked my opinion on a revolution, like I'd really tell them. I told them all black folks should move back to Africa. Having survived, play cool. You can hear me? Oh, okay. Having, <laughs> um, having survived, play cool in the Tet Offensive, I set out to make up for all the nookie I had missed. Good Poon Tang is life affirming and I needed to check daily to see if I was still alive. Trust was a bit hard to come by, so I set out to find people of like minds. Most of the homies were strung out on partying. Skag was taking over the neighborhood. Even the offsprings of the black bourgeoisie nodded. The talent in 10th mainland, not liking needles, I dodged a doogee, but bullets. Everybody else was strung out on Jesus. I was searching for Ogun, but this was the late 60s in the Black Belt South, and he was hiding out, not to be found. I thought of, about checking out the NOI, but I was too cool for that. I rocked bell bottom hip huggers and a big afro. Bow ties and bean pies just didn't satisfy my sense of style. Packed up my sky blue VW bug snuck off to Newark in the middle of the night looking for the revolution. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, let's hear it for Ngoma Hill. Ooh. Thank you. That was incredible, thank you. We have two more poets left. Next up, we have Michelle Whitaker. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's um, quite lovely uh, to see your faces. Um, it's been a while, um, but I do look forward to seeing many of you in, um, in person, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just going to read a few poems. Uh, the first one that is in the book, and thank you for publishing. It's a, it was a little favorite poem of mine and um, called Hunt. And it goes, you think I'm a lovely hunt, but there is a no in my moan. There is wanted rest for my soothsaying, my oh my trailing thigh off in your mouth. I wish I could turn that into a little song, but it didn't quite work. I'm going to read um, this poem called uh, Partial Life Review. It's after Marie Howe's poem, um, part of Eve's discussion. It was like the moment when a rare pine wobbler flew over the highway lane. Just before entering those shelf clouds in the near distance, just before you saw the wall of rain leaving inches of itself further down the road before hydroplanking disturbances. But for a moment, you felt this deluge as a divine sanction or sweet suspicion like the over arousal of when a hatchback's tires and brakes disagree as a steering committee, or very much like when you kept checking for the headlights in the rear view mirror, when for a moment you're offered a clarity about why your partner paints bamboo shoots over and over, and why you don't have the heart to answer when he asks again if this time looks similar to the real thing, when no, the nature of it all still looks like cancer. I 
And then um, I'm gonna read um, from Great Great Weather, put this beautiful book together um, called Surge. And I'm gonna read um, In the Afterlife. What comes to mind is Kurt. He's the first thought rather than lost. And I imagine his mother godmothering at his grave, reimagining the austere earth closed. And then what comes to mind spasms like the cramp of a Charlie horse tasking for the heart. And go ahead, call me deficient, like the canary I watched hit its yellow off a barn window. When in fact, what comes to mind is German, like a shepherd groaning at acres of birds or for another bone to pick or carrot to snap as we wallow in the nude, as ginger wades in disease, as echinacea wades in the brain. And while boiled rice misgoverns as overcast, rosin waits as a diamond at the knuckle. But really, what comes to mind is dehydrated, an apricot warping in his mouth as we sit inside a waterfall's cave, past Walnut Creek, around Zion Valley, if I can only remember the feel of his broad shoulder, like an empty ball court against my shoulder as he grabs for the broken spine of Siddhartha. But we don't really need to talk about that fact. And we don't really need to talk about the thunder thundering inside his house where he died. And this poem is for my grandmother called uh, Frequently Asked Answers. The thought of my grandmother's death often visits the thought of Jesus cleaned and prepared for gravity. Even the clanging of symbols or catechisms against prayer wheels in the brain no longer lie grave. My oncologist outlining a group of disorganized nodules mirrors the grass plots for a Freeport graveyard. The thought of resistance interrupts this drinking, drinking interrupts this dunderhead, masking ovarian grief. The reality of being born again crawls in and out of bed and certain positions seem prone to restless griping. Loving someone depressed dying and in self-denial deepens the daily routine for creating art or like grievances circling her courtyard in front of a bed of geraniums also diseased as if deeming ourselves mapless or ageless like a luminary acquiescence or just tormented when virtue subsumes the blade. Thanks everybody. Wow, Michelle Whitaker. Thank you, Michelle. Our final reader for today has a long history with Great Weather for Media. He has been a contributor as a writer to our books. Uh, for one of the anthologies, he was the prose editor for that particular book. And uh, this past year, we brought out uh, his wonderful poetry collection, which as it turned out, even though, even though uh, we put it together before the pandemic, it is the ideal uh, reading for being stuck inside during the pandemic. It's called Tricks of Light. And just like Michelle Whitaker's Surge, it's available from Great Weather for Media. Thaddeus Rakowski. And that is okay, unmuting oh, here. Okay. okay. No, go ahead, David. No, I was just going to say, take yourself off mute. Okay. Right uh, on top. Of it. Yeah. Uh, thanks to all the editors who are here uh, for putting together this anthology. This is like a who's who of uh, of uh, creative writers. Um, I'm glad to be part of it and glad to see all of you today. Um, I'm just going to read my story from the anthology. It's three pages, so that will, that will take up my time. Um, this story is about anxiety over working at a job. It's kind of surrealistic. 
hope that's okay if I'm reading a story. Um, it's called When the Work Runs Out. I'm working in a divided city. As I go from one side to the other, the landscape changes, becomes more desolate. My assignment is to meet people in their apartments and find out how life is different on the other side. One person tells me life is not so hard on his side, except that when a light bulb burns out, it's hard to find a replacement. I have to meet a deadline to get back to the other side, my side. Travel ceases at a certain hour. I sneak through a corridor of the travel terminal, which straddles the border and find myself on the familiar side. I'm not trapped, though I was afraid I would be. In my apartment, I want to turn on the lights, but my room remains dark. I flip the switches on all of the fixtures, but the lights won't come on. One, gl one bulb glows orange, but it's too dim to illuminate the room. I reach up and turn on the lamp over my head. I could do that, but I don't. So the room stays dark. My office has been redesigned. I see that my work area is on a new countertop, but it isn't far from my supervisor's desk. Luckily, she doesn't spend much time at her desk because she has to attend meetings. At the end of the workday, I order some Chinese food to take home, but there is a misunderstanding. I received two gallons of soup and some other dishes. I'm going to have to take a cab to get this amount of food home. I go out to the street, walk a couple of blocks and realize I've left the food in my office, but I get lost trying to return to the building. I go through an archway and across a courtyard. The streets don't look familiar anymore. In my work area, my supervisor is at her desk. I realize I'm leaving too early, even though it is after 6 p.m. I shouldn't leave while she is still working. She talks about the article she's reading on her computer screen, complains about it. We have to follow the guidebook, she says, but no one reads it. Have you read it? I admit I haven't. I pick up my Chinese food. One carton of noodles is the perfect size and shape for my briefcase. I leave the rest of the food on my desk and head for the elevator. I'm visiting friends in their apartment. It's strange to be at the friend's place because I haven't seen this person and his wife in a couple of years, but they are nice enough. The problem is I've left work too early and must go back to the office. Pages have been done by others in my absence, but the elements don't fit on the pages. I call in on a telephone, but my supervisor can't explain the problem to me. Her voice trails off and goes silent. Hello, I say, hello, but she doesn't answer. Maybe she is listening without speaking or maybe the line has gone dead. I leave the friend's apartment and go out to the street to catch a cab. I see no cabs, so I start walking. Soon I realize I've been walking in the wrong direction. I'm way downtown and west when I wanted to go uptown and east. There are no cabs because there's been a storm. None of the street lights are working. A cab stops with passengers in it. Get in, the driver says. I can't take more than one. I can take more than one fare when the power is out. I almost don't respond, and he almost drives away. The cab starts to roll forward. I run to the car, rip open a back door, and jump in. When I get to work, I see that my desk has been moved to a separate building. My new room is big, like a loft space, but I have to share it with three other people. I'm the first one in, so I unpack my belongings. I have more than I need for the day. I have food and boxes of cereal. My computer is just my laptop. When it's time to start working, I don't know what to do. I can't tell where the material is on the computer. My supervisor is in the main building, not my building. I could go and ask her what to do. I'm cut off from the key people at the company, but I'm lucky. One woman in the inner circle has to wear chains to work, like a slave. But I am not fettered, though I have nothing to do. I spend my time rearranging, rearranging my belongings so they take up less space. The chief boss comes over to my building. 
I look outside and see him approaching, but he's not coming to where I work. He's walking to a Buddhist temple next door. He sits on the flagstones in front of the temple and opens his laptop computer. He meditates on documents. He's a spiritual man. My supervisor says to me, in two days, the company won't, won't be able to pay you anymore, so you'll have to leave. I understand I'll lose my job in two days. 48 hours isn't much notice, but that's the way it has to be. As the second day arrives, I go into my office, but I don't speak to anyone. I don't say I'm leaving and I don't say goodbye. I don't work very hard either. I pretend to look at some charts, fever lines showing economic trends, but I have no suggestions for the graphics people. I have no changes to make. I'm not sure what I'll do after my last day of work, but I figure I can collect unemployment pay for a while. I don't know how I'll take my possessions with me. I own some of the books on my desk. They are too numerous and heavy for me to carry all at once. Even so, I'm not planning to make another trip. I'm not coming back. Thank you. All right, let's hear it for Thad. Rakowski! Right. Yay!